Geneva, Reading. In a perfect world, all these conversations about murders would start and end with a victim. Almost every one, even people who knew their lives were at great risk, started their day believing it would end like every other. Of course, it did not. Someone came into their world and stopped their life clock, always before they were meant to go. I do understand that people of faith will argue that no matter the horror and loss, it is all part of God's plan, and we should take comfort in that belief. If that is your belief, and you find comfort in it, I won't argue the point. I respect it, and I certainly understand the need to make some sense of it. I will admit, I don't have a handle on anything God wants. In my mind, there's only one place to set responsibility when someone is murdered. It's not with God, or Satan, or any other entity. Responsibility rests fully with the killers. But at isn't the story really right? We don't make movies and television shows or write books and sell newspapers and televise news programs commemorating the victim, mostly. Uh, we give a nod and say thoughts and prayers for their families and all that. Maybe put praying hand emojis on our social media. No, nah, the real story is the case. The evil killer stalking the night looking for his prey or the wrongly accused soul who could not possibly have done it. The dedicated steely-eyed detectives determined to get justice or their incompetence that doesn't solve it or solves it incorrectly through perceived shoddy police work or corruption. The courtroom drama of life playing out in front of us with brilliantly sharp talking attorneys fighting for justice on each side and stoic judges making sure that the hearings are proper and just. That's what sells. There's no profit in going too far down the rabbit hole of the overwhelming loss of the victim in a day-to-day Hour to hour, minute to minute grind of their loved ones trying to move on with their lives. But hey, I know what that is. It's not a perfect world by a margin. I get that. I've seen it enough to know. I'm not crying the blues. I'm not trying to change the world. But while we may not be able to celebrate and commemorate every victim, sometimes, I think anyway, we should take pause and give them some thought. Such is the story I'm going to describe in today's episode. Sure, I'm going to talk about the case. I'm going to tell you about the killers and about our investigation. But I'll tell you now, the killers were no master criminals, and it took no elite level of detective work to solve it. Now, this case and this story is about the victim, Geneva Redding. Welcome back to the Detective Story Podcast. I am Mike Hammond. Thank you for joining in. As I described in the intro, this episode, we're going to discuss the case of Geneva Redding. Geneva Redding was an 85-year-old woman who was murdered in her home at 1942 South Avers Avenue in Chicago by three men on August 31st, 2002. Or actually, her body was, was discovered on August 31st, but she had been killed two possibly three days before, and her body dropped into the crawl space under her home. For at least two days, district patrol officers, family members, and neighbors searched for her. In fact, the very first morning, the neighbors didn't hear Miss Geneva's gate clang and see her outside of her home sweeping the sidewalk and picking up debris. The neighbors were concerned. Her presence in the early morning walking the block was as regular as a Swiss timepiece. As the day wore on, and they saw no movement from the home. The concern grew to the point where they began to contact her family, trying to contact her family, and then ultimately calling the police. Their sense of unease was heightened by the fact that throughout the day, they also did not see the first floor tenant that Miss Geneva had allowed into the building. Though typical of her to help neighborhood wayward souls, the neighbors had a bad feeling about this one. His name was Alvin Jones, and he had come back to the neighborhood after being released on parole from his latest of a lifelong series of prison sentences. Now, say, it's my experience that the people in much of the city of Chicago will not necessarily hold time in prison against someone. It's an all-too-common fact of life, especially in some of the very economically challenged sections of the city. But, It is also my experience that the finely tuned instinct of the people that live in many parts of the city trumps that benefit of the doubt. The neighbors of Miss Geneva Redding 
and the 1900 block of South Avers instincts and protective nature of her gave Alvin Jones very little leeway. So when their concern for Miss Geneva's absence grew, so did their suspicion at the coinciding lack of presence of Alvin Jones. So I'll continue with this story and the investigation, but first I'd like to give you an idea of what an amazing human being Geneva Redding was. I learned quite a bit of information from the neighbors and her family at the time and saw the framed photographs of her with all sorts of celebrities throughout her home, but I, I never had the pleasure of meeting her. So I'll defer to someone who knew her very well. Please give a listen. I was born uh, three blocks from her house on the same street, uh -huh. well, across from Penn on Avers and uh, 16th Street. I was born over that way. I got you. And she had had that house ever since I was a baby. Uh -huh. She worked in a laundry, her and my mom. They worked in uh, one of those big uh, hotel laundry factories. And uh -huh. she wanted to buy the house from what she's telling me. She wanted to buy a house. And that house cost her 17000 I believe. Uh -huh. The house, yeah. the, the the house, house that I was in, nineteen forty two South Avery. Uh huh. Right. Yes, with the house that you found her in. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And my oldest brother, my my two older brothers, Melvin and Willie, they were babies when she bought that house. Oh, I see. Yeah. So she was into plants and vegetables. You know. Uh huh. She loved, she loved, uh, she had strawberries. She would pass them out to neighbors. She had a berry, a blackberry tree in front of her house. When did she move in over there? Do you know what year it was about? It was around nine. My brother was born in 49. So it had to be around 45. She bought that house in 1945? 45, wow. yes. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. And and she was the only owner of it. Huh. It was built new yeah. then, huh? Built new by, by a Polish guy, yeah. Huh. And it was um, it was uh, supposed to be another another building on the other side of that sidewalk in the back. Oh, and I see. She bought huh. that up too. Oh yeah, right. Smart. No, so, so she would have she would have us out there just. Hoeing and, and, you know, the yard, the digging and planting seeds. Garden work, right? Greens, vegetables and everything, you know. She'd take us on long trips in the summer. You know, she was mostly a working woman, but when she would take her vacation, her and my granddad, we would, uh, and all the kids, we would ride with her to Milwaukee. And she had friends there, and we would stay there for a weekend and come back home. Huh. You know, uh... She was she was hardcore. We we didn't wash clothes in the uh, in the tub. You know we had to we had to wash clothes in the tub. There wasn't no laundromat to go to. Yeah. Yeah. She nobody had. Machine. Very few people had washers and dryers back then in their home, right? Right. She took care of her great aunt. She was like a hundred and three. She took care of her. She converted part of her bedroom where the window where we clammed in. She had transformed that part of the dining room into a, my great aunt's, uh, her great aunt's uh, bed, made it into a bedroom. Mm -hmm. And she took care of her until she passed. And she was about 103 when she passed. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And she, uh, she had, what, one son and one daughter. Miss Geneva did? Uh-huh. Yeah. She had one son and one daughter. Were they still alive at the time that, th that this happened? No. My mom, my uncle had died about in 76. 76. And my mom died in 96. Wow. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. So, and I'm so glad they didn't get to see that. You know, yeah, yeah, me too, but me too. At the age that they would have been, you know, I'm just glad they didn't get to see that. Sure. That was Miss Geneva Crosby, granddaughter of Geneva Redding, who was kind enough to revisit this with me.
That was the beginning of a story about an amazing, tough, and independent woman who moved into her neighborhood just after World War II and almost immediately set up shop as its stalwart and protector for the next 57 years. Listen to, to some more from Miss Crosby, please. I'm interested. Did she ever talk about what the neighborhood was like when she moved in there? Because I, I, I just I, the West Side changed a lot. I know, but it, when 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 it was a lot like in the late '50s, uh, early '60s. Um, but what was it? What was it like when she was when she moved in? Did she ever talk about that? Well, she talked about no, but she she talked about times when she would go out. Uh huh. She would go out to. Uh, you know, on the weekends, on the Fridays, you know, she go out on Fridays, her, my mom, my uncle, you know, uh, like mostly the, just family, you uh -huh. know, it's a family like going the, out thing. Uh-huh, to like dancing uh, yes. clubs type like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was really big in that, like after World War II, right? When everybody, yeah, when they were wet and white petticoats. Yeah, right. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. remember the black and white one I used to see her in, you know, spike heels. <laughs> She come home one night, and we hear a lot of commotion. We get up out the bed, and I guess somebody was trying to rob her. Oh, jeez. And that was before the fence, before the tall fence. Uh-huh. <laughs> she pulled up her skirt and grabbed her a little 22 out of her <laughs> stocking. <laughs> and she shot this guy in his butt. Oh, is that right? <laughs> All right. I love that. I love he that. Him in his butt. I don't know whatever happened. I know the police had came and uh, they talked with her and stuff, but they didn't bother her. I'm sure not. Like, they didn't bother her. They let it go. You know, it, it wasn't like it is now. Yeah. You know. No, for sure. So, but, yeah, well, that's a great story, and it doesn't surprise me based on what I learned about her. I mean, one the one thing that uh, that I I, I got. I'm fairly familiar with during the course of that investigation was that mm -hmm. Miss Geneva was no wilting flower. She did not. Uh, uh, she just wasn't a person that would take uh, take any uh, nonsense from anybody. It sounded right. like you know, right? You know, um, she would. Uh, she moved in this pastor. He was new to Chicago, and he he, he was Caucasian. And he was he was young, in late twenties. His name was Steve. Uh -huh. She she moved him in her attic apartment. And she said, "When you get ready to walk out, let me know. I'll walk with you. Uh, I'll take care of you." Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So she grew that name shotgun, Annie. <laughs> so she would, <laughs> she would take care. She took care of him. She babysitted for him. You know. Uh -huh. um, she, she she just took care of him, you know, and she, he was able to get out on his own and know the area. And she, she would let people know who he was, you know, mm -hmm. because he wasn't, white people wasn't in the area then. Yeah, I understand. And, but she opened her arms and her doors for him, his family, and she took him around. She showed him the church where he wanted, where he was interested in being. Mm -hmm. And plus the medical clinic where he ended up uh, being part of that, too. Right. So, and he's still over there. He's still over there. Is that right? Yeah, he's still over there. When I think about this, it kind of makes me smile because what I learned about her and um, who she was, and she was a fighter. She fought like walking. Stick her nails in you <laughs> and come out with some stuff. You know, yeah, I'm she, sure. She I'm would sure. do that. How about that? Shotgun Annie who sent a would-be robber hopping away after shooting him in the ass with a twenty two pistol. And then later took in a white pastor and his family who had moved into the neighborhood, made sure he got acc acclimated safely, and everyone knew that he, he had her blessing. So does that start to paint a picture? She was tough, loyal, independent, and fierce when necessary. But not just those things. A fighter until the end. She went back to school when she was late 70s. Wow. And to do a uh, home health care, huh. and that's what she did. She did home health care. She she liked taking care of people. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. She she loved taking care of people. You know, she go buy things from the rumor cell, and she'll have an officer to bring her back home. 
That's so good. they're calling to see if they can get take her back home. They say, yeah, take her home. <laughs> right. And they, they got to know her on the dispatch, you know. I'm sure. Certain time she in the house. And she would take all that stuff that she bought and she bag it and pass it out to people that she know they needed clothes. They had a bunch of kids and she would take that and take care of them. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that, 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 amazing. She would go, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I thought she was just talking, but I, until I found pictures of her shaking Princess Diana's hand with Daly, uh, Daly, young Daly, and Stroger. I mean, everybody was already saying how, how popular what she was and how the neighbors were worried about her and all that stuff. But one of the things that really still sticks with me is when I went up into an apartment there, she had pictures on the wall. And you tell me if I'm recalling this incorrectly, but in my in my memory, she had pictures of herself with like James Earl Jones, the actor, I think Harold Washington, right. maybe. Right. Uh, they had did a movie on the block. Right. And it was using her house for the staging area, you know, set up and stuff, make up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And Robert Duvall was in that movie too. I don't recall. Yeah, I don't yeah. recall if I saw a picture of her with him or not. Um, but uh, oh, they were so in love with her. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know if you recall this or not, but when I, when I was kind of researching this again, you know, I was just looking online and stuff, and I found I, I never. I don't think I knew this even. Uh, you know, at the time I was working on the case, but. In uh, July 4th in 1995, which it must have been when they were filming that movie, the movie was called The Family Thing. And yeah, I, I yeah. still have never seen it. I'm excited to watch it now just to see if, you know, like uh, if I, if she's in it or I can see her house or whatever, you know. But uh, you, you would see the house. Yeah. But it, it's, it's like a quick, the most house was across the street. But they stayed in her house and, and, and. Come out there. Yeah, worked out of there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, it, so in July, July 4th of 1995, and you can see it online, uh, the Chicago Tribune did an article about the movie being filmed there, and they interviewed Miss Geneva. And it was pretty cute because she's like, oh, I'm so excited that this is going on. I'm so excited for the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, oh, okay. you, you, you could just tell she's, you know, she's very proud of her neighborhood and very right, right, excited right. about all that. She loves her neighborhood. Yeah. So all those pictures of her with the celebrities, I mean, was it all from the movie or was it like uh, other things too? Just other things too. She, uh, she took, she, she had a, had a picture shaking Prince Diana's hand in City Hall, at City Hall. She got a picture shaking Mayor, Mayor Daly, young Mayor Daly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Stroger, she called him old man Stroger. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> She would tell you, she would tell me stuff, and, and I said, mm, "No, Jesus." That's I called her Jen. I didn't call her Granny. Yeah. You no, know, she didn't want me to call her Granny. Quit letting people know I'm a Granny. <laughs> 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 Again, that sounds walk, a lot like my grandma. She would walk from her house, 19th and Neighbors, all the way up to 26th Street, do her banking. Then she'd go a little further over to Jules, and then she'd go across the street to Osco's. Then she'd come back to 26th Street. She walk down about four blocks from Pulaski in 26, either direction. And she have so many bags. <laughs> and she'd flag her down an officer. And I tell you, each one would call dispatch. Can you take this? She'd tell them. They say they can't take it. They, we can't take you home. We're not a cab. <laughs> And she said, I bet you if you call this dispatch, they're going to tell you to take me home. Call them. I said, they will call. And they said, well, come on. And they will take her home. <laughs> I love that story. I mean, it's painful to hear a policeman would, wouldn't help her out from the start, but I understand they're busy and they got stuff going on. But right, that, right, right. That, they laughed. They ended up laughing, talking. I'm uh, sure they did. Being friends, that's how she met a lot of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure and they did. They were working on her on the L tracks over there. Yeah. Rebuilding the track. Uh huh. Was that and track there when she bought the house? Do you know? Yes. Yeah. Okay. She would go. She would call me and my husband, and we would have to go to the restaurant and buy buckets of chicken, and 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 she had pops and stuff ready for, her. and she would feed those people on the track that's working. Oh, wow. come on, eat. 
<laughs> That's so great. Sit down and come eat. That's and they so was great. trying to not come eat, but they see it was bought, just bought. They come down, they eat, they laugh and talk with her. Yeah. We say bye, you know, because we knew she was okay. <laughs> yeah, that's so uh, another great story there. That's it's. And the railroad people, they would they they would supervise all of them. They would sit there and eat with her. You know, so well, and, and when they were gone, she was sad because they were gone. You know, because they, they were there a while. Yeah, it's company. I get that totally. Yeah. 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 An entire life dedicated to her neighbors and community, involvement in every way. She was interested, active, and always the leader that people looked to. Clearly, when Mayor Daly needed someone from the community to showcase an entire rebuild of a train line, Miss Geneva was there. Princess Diana, Mayor Richie Daly, John Stroger, the longtime serving president of the Cook County Board, Reverend Jesse Jackson, James Earl Jones, and Harold Washington, Chicago's first African-American mayor, just to name a few, all pictured with Miss Geneva Redding. A pretty good picture of an amazing life, in my opinion, a life to be celebrated. So I want to change course here briefly because the subject comes up occasionally, and Miss Crosby had something interesting to say. That caught my ear. As a retired homicide detective, I get asked by people occasionally if I ever witnessed anything supernatural, saw ghosts, or ever got creeped out dealing with so many vi- dead bodies and violence. The answer is a pretty unromantic no. I've been in some indescribably creepy places and saw horrors beyond description, but nothing not unexplainable in my head, nothing that was beyond human involvement based on my own experience. I'm just not a very superstitious person. Maybe I had it drummed out of me over the years. But I'll tell you, I was once working with my partner on a multi-day case, and we had to go to the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, the Cook County Morgue for all real purposes, to get some information on a victim. I remember that I was tired as it was one of those two or three day cases with little to no sleep. It was 3 or 4 a.m. and my partner was gathering the information from the staff, and I just kind of ambled into the main storage room. The room itself is a three-quarter football field-sized room designed kind of for nightmares, really. It is filled about five rows high with open stainless steel shelves as far as the eye can see. Literally hundreds of dead bodies sitting on open shelves in a cooled storage room. Not my favorite place, but after 100 trips or better, you just get numb to it. But on this night, I recall standing in one of the aisles near the middle and just closing my eyes and listening. Why and for what? No idea. Just exhaustion, maybe, I guess. Or hoping for a shortcut. One of them to give me answers I was tired of looking for. Something. I don't know. But I got zero. Nothing. After a few minutes, I felt stupid and walked out. You know, maybe I'm just not open to it. Why would I tell that story here? For those of you who are open to such things, listen to this. She always had a weird feeling about the house. I know you mentioned that the other day. Yeah, uh, and so did my mom. Really? I wonder why that is, do you think? I'm not sure. But my mom used to say, I don't want my grandkids going over mama's house. You know, and this was before my mom passed. This was the same year, the same month that my mom passed. That she said that. She said, I don't, want, don't let the kids go over there, Jenny. I don't want them to spend the night over there. I said, why? You know... She never will say. Hmm. I'm a little bit stuck on her feeling so, and your and your mom feeling so uncomfortable in that house because, I mean, she bought it new, right? So it's not like right. something bad happened there before she moved in, you know? Uh, right, right. Uh, I guess that's just a feeling or an instinct, just whatever. Just a feeling, yeah, an instinct, some insight she had. Not too much, really, right? A bad feeling, just something uncomfortable. But listen to this little tidbit. I was home taking care. I took a leave of absence from work to take care of my brother. He was dying, and he was living with me. Uh-huh. And he kept telling me, he said, I see, I see Jen, I see Uncle Jesse, I see Grandma. I said, what? I said, nothing's wrong with Jen. I can see you seeing the other ones, really. But Jen at home, she said, okay. He said, no, I see her. You know, <laughs> I said, wow. So I tried calling her. I didn't get no answer. So in the days that Geneva Redding was missing, and almost certainly deceased, deceased for sure. And while the neighbors were trying to get a hold of Miss Crosby, her dying brother, who she was caring for, 
was hallucinating and seeing their dead relatives. And then so he said he saw Jenny, Miss Redding. Miss Crosby, telling him that it can't be, she's fine right down the street, not yet knowing what was going on. And she was already gone. What's that all mean for this case? Nothing, really. But I got to say, as a detective, you can never discount, you can't just discount information given to you. But some of it's just not useful, especially in a court of law. What's that mean? I don't know. I'll leave it to you. But I will say I appreciate Miss Crosby sharing it. So, a pretty complete picture of the amazing Geneva Redding. But I'm sure by this time you're asking, all right, well, so what happened? It has little relevance in my head as compared to the significance and the fullness of her life. But here it is anyway. And this is the reason to tell you the story, I guess. But as it goes on and the investigation begins, I'll let Miss Crosby explain the initial stage. So, so the way this shook out for me was I didn't, um, because I was a homicide detective at the time, I, I didn't get called over there until she, she, uh, Sergeant Ferrer found her. Uh, and because the, 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 I know you were probably alerted too, but the, the neighbors were very concerned, like uh, the first day they didn't see her outside. Um, right. Right. That's and, when they didn't hear that gate. Yeah, right. They kept trying to find my number. So I tried calling her. I didn't get no answer. So the next day, which was that Saturday, one of her neighbors called me. And they said, you didn't leave his granddaughter, right? You George's daughter. I said, yes. She said, well, we can't find your grandmama. We ain't seen her or nothing. Ain't heard that gate rattling or nothing. I said, okay, you'll be right there. So I got over there. Uh, Turner. He gave me, uh, he, he lived in the big castle-like building. He gave me, uh, brought a ladder over, and there in the office of white shirt went up. Went up, because uh, we kept hitting the gate, climbing the gate, nothing. So we climbed up. I said, oh, wow, something's, something's happened here. Uh -huh. And so... Uh, he said, well, how you know? We just got up here. You said you ain't been here in about a week or so. I said, right. I said, but I see things is missing. Things is gone. Huh. He said, well, how can you tell that? I said, because this, she has something here, something here, that's missing. And he said, oh. You know, we looked around. He said, don't touch anything. He opened the door for everybody to go on back out. And we held hands and went into prayer. And then he said, now I want you to, I want you to just, just, just concentrate. When we gonna pray. I said okay. So we did that. And he said now I want you to leave and don't talk to nobody. Don't say anything. So we don't know who's outside. Okay. I felt so faint going down the stairs, but I, you know, made it on down the stairs and stuff. So he said don't talk to nobody. I said okay. <laughs> well I didn't, you know. So even my family, I wouldn't even talk to them. You know, that's that's good work by him. I know it's hard for you. That's good work by him because that may, you know that makes my job a lot easier. You know what I mean? He's protecting right, the right. protecting the infer not just the scene, but protecting the information as well. You know, that's uh, that's really good work by him, which doesn't surprise me. He's a really good man. So I, they went all over the house. And stuff. And he sent a picture out. He said, "Is is this a hatch of grandma where?" I said, "Yeah, it is." He said, "Okay." He went back in. This, she had a floor torn up in her. First floor bedroom. Uh -huh. And that used to be that used to be our room. And my mom used to stay on the first floor. And she was having that floor torn out. Oh, I see. I see. To to put a new floor in, you know. Now that floor, she used to raise that up and could, could go up under that, you know. Uh -huh. But we never did. Nobody never went up under there. It was just there. Yeah. You know. And but she wanted that floor to be more solid. Mm -hmm. And she had had that window deal. Right. And so those, uh, I couldn't, we couldn't think of it. A few weeks we saw the garbage cans were gone. And I said, where's well, her garbage cans? So the officer said they loaded her garbage cans with her property. And people in the area recall people walking through the alley with the garbage cans. Yeah, right. That's kind of what started us kind of uh, 
uh, started us on the track of actually solving it was the people reporting that. And then the one of the three guys uh, was trying to sell some of her property. What Miss Crosby is describing there is the police led by some Sergeant Ramon Ferrer, who I knew well and was actually my field training officer when I first got out of the police academy. That's the story then following up and the concern involving Miss Crosby and the initial search of Miss Redding's home. It became clear, as you can tell from her description, that something was very wrong. So it goes like this. We know that we need to find Alvin Jones just to get an answer. And we know that her house was ransacked from Miss Crosby. And then we get alerted from the 10th District Patrol that they have a Clarence White in custody after finding him trying to sell some of Miss Redding's belongings. So they brought him into Area 4, my office at the time, my partner's office. And he pretty quickly gives a, a statement, an account of what happened on the night that she was killed. It was a self-serving statement, and he, and he took himself out of it. It didn't take any real great interrogation technique or anything like that to get him to talk. He knew by that time that the neighborhood was upset over her death, and he knew he was knee-deep in it, and he wanted to talk. Now, again, his story, as it turns out, was pretty self-serving. He said he was involved with a guy named Stephen Shines and another guy named Alvin Jones in taking things from Miss Geneva's house, but he stated in his initial statement that he basically stayed outside as a lookout with the trash cans and took the stuff as they handed it out from her house and put it in the trash cans and took it away. So not having a lot more to go on, we had to kind of let him go with that statement, not let him go. He was charged with uh, burglary and possession of stolen property, whatever it was, and, and, and booked eventually in the, into the Cook County Jail. But based on his statement, then we're looking for Stephen Shines and of course, Alvin Jones now with cause that they were directly involved with her murder. So initially, Stephen Shines was found after we put out an investigative alert, which is like a our term for a citywide alert to other policemen that were looking for him. And he's brought in first. Stephen Shines has a little more violent background than Clarence White. Clarence White had a criminal background, but it was mostly not violent. Uh, burglaries, as I recall, thefts, things of that nature. Um, and But Stephen Shines had a little more serious criminal record, had an armed robbery, at least in his background. I don't recall uh, specifically, but I just do recall noting that he was a little more violent in nature in his uh, arrest history. And he also was pretty quick to give a statement. Um, again, this is all over the neighborhood. The neighborhood's upset at her at her loss. And uh, he wants out from underneath too. He tells a story that's pretty self-serving as well, but he does say that he, he helped try and subdue Miss Redding, but it was Alvin Jones that actually killed her and he helped take some of her stuff out things. And um, so he was charged, but we knew ultimately we had to find Alvin Jones, get him in. And uh, we had a lot of cooperation as his own family as a, uh, as you'll hear Miss Crosby describe, was was helpful. Uh, they knew he wasn't a great guy, and they also knew and cared a lot about Miss Redding. Um, so it happens about a week or so later. I don't remember the exact time frame on this, but we got a call that Alvin Jones was in a large apartment building, in an apartment in a large apartment building near Garfield Park on the west side of Chicago there. And so we kind of rounded up the troops, my partner and I, and whatever detectives were available, some tac tactical officers from the 11th district where that building was located. And we went over there to try and locate Alvin Jones. Now, I got to say at this point that we had been told by his family that he was openly saying he wasn't going back to prison. He killed a policeman. He shoot a policeman. He had a gun. He'd shoot a policeman before he go back to jail, make the policeman, make the police kill him, things like that. We made other policemen aware of this and we are aware of it. So when we go out there, you're hoping for the best, but you got to be prepared, tactically prepared for whatever happens. Um, so in driving out there uh, and approaching the building, my partner at the time, Sam Manto, we see a guy walking kind of away from the building through a parkway towards Garfield Park. Now it's dark. It's kind of later at night. And two things struck us. One, and those walking away from us, in the basic physical way, met Alvin Jones' description. More importantly, it was just the instinct and feeling of, you know, what's, where's this guy going? This, he looks like he's in a hurry, trying like he's not, trying to look like he's not in a hurry. And uh, if he makes it to that park, it's going to be tough to, uh, to track him down. And uh, so we decided to veer off 
and uh, and let the, the guys know we were we were going to go stop this guy. So we we approach him, and he says back to us, but we're you know we're ready for whatever needs to be done. But the fact is, when we got out of our car and and, and yelled at him to to stop and talk to us, and he turned around. It was clearly Alvin Jones, very distinct looking guy, and uh, and he also clearly had no desire to fight it out with us. And uh, thankfully, and uh, and and gave up. So we had him in custody, and then he also starts talking r- pretty much right away, but his story was even more incredulous. He's, he's trying to really put it off on Clarence White, Stephen Shines, and so we got a writ to get Clarence White, Stephen Shines out of the county jail. We brought him back, all back, so we had all three in Area 4 separated so we could kind of talk to him and get get to the meat of what the real story was. It didn't take a long time, really, and all, all three of them gave statements that were much more in line, I think, with what happened. So this is how it shakes out. Alvin Jones, Clarence White, and Stephen Shines came to an agreement based on a plan hatched by Alvin Jones. And the plan was believing that Miss Geneva had a bunch of money hidden in her apartment, was to make entry through a window on the first floor because he knew he wasn't allowed in if he came home after dark, and he also didn't want her to recognize him, if at all possible. Their plan, as it was, was to turn a stereo up loud, which would cause Miss Geneva to come downstairs and admonish Jones to turn the music down and probably ask him how did he get in or whatever. And when she came down, their plan was to overpower, tie her up, take her money from the apartment, and then make their escape, and Jones could return, act a hero, and rescue her or whatever. You know, I know this is not an Ocean's Eleven type plan here, but I guess it was plausible in their heads. But the plan had one fatal flaw. As you've heard, Miss Geneva was not your average 85-year-old woman who sat knitted all day and watched TV. She was active, in good shape, and most importantly, fierce. So when our three hapless intruders attempted to overtake her, they were working at a major disadvantage. They had brought hubris to a war and Miss Geneva lived her entire life in preparation for war, whatever form that war might take. So when the fighting began, she started to rip them to shreds. Unfortunately, they had numbers on their side, and when they realized they were about to get overrun by a superior force, Alvin Jones and Stephen Shines tackled her to the ground. Alvin Jones got her by the throat and began choking her, and Stephen Shines grabbed a stick or a piece of wood and began pummeling, pummeling her about the face and head. And finally, pleading for his help, Clarence White joined his co-conspirators and sat on her legs to immobilize her. Despite her toughness and refusal to give in, she was eventually overcome and died from her injuries. The Cook County Medical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy on Miss Geneva and determined the cause of her death to be strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. And of course, they ruled it a homicide. So back to our guys here, their plan completely in shambles. The three criminals pivoted. Alvin Jones recalled there was a crawl space entrance in the bedroom. So they drug her body there and unceremoniously dropped her down in the crawl space. They covered the crawl space door with construction debris and then began to rummage through her belongings in the apartment. They never found the big money that Jones claimed was there, but Over the course of the next couple of nights, they came back, stole what they could, and used her trash cans to cart away her belongings. Soon thereafter, with the great community cooperation that we got, they were in custody. That's it. That's the story of their big plan and how they ended up murdering this amazing human being. I encourage you, if you're interested, to get on your internet and go to the IDOC website, the Illinois Department of Corrections, and go to the Inmate Search tab. You're not going to find Clarence White there, and you're not going to find Stephen Shines there. Both of them pled out to something less than murder. I don't remember exactly. Clarence White taking the shortest time, which I think was in the neighborhood of 12 years. And Stephen Shines taking a little bit more responsibility and a little more time. But again, something less than murder. And you don't recall what that was either 15 or 20 years. I don't recall, but both are out is the point. Now they're both paroled out and I don't know what's become of them. Don't care to find out really. But if you go to that inmate search tab and search the name Alvin Jones, he is the only Alvin Jones in there as of the recording of this show. He's born in 1955, just in case it's years from now and there's more than one. 
But take a look at him. He's put on a little weight since I saw him last. So have I for that matter. But still, that's him. Pretty distinctive looking guy. But now scroll down for a bit. And you look at the crimes he's been in prison for that they list. Not arrested, mind you. Or arrested and found not guilty. Or brought in for questioning or anything. But actual convictions for which he's been in prison in one lifetime. Rape. Robberies. Unlawful restraint. Attempted murder. Burglary. Escape. Several more. By the time he killed Miss Geneva, he was 47 years old and had been sentenced to 53 years in prison. All those things before he came across Geneva Redding's good graces. I don't know. I have no big statement about that, really. I just thought you might find it interesting. We could have an entire philosophical discussion about his track record and time and what it means and all of that. I just thought you might be interested to see him learn his history. But again... This episode is not about Alvin Jones, his partners in crime, or even De- Detective Mike Hammond and my partners, or justice, or vengeance, or even a semblance of some order restored. Sometimes you just have to play the long game and understand that's all there is. What are Miss Crosby's thoughts? I'll let this run out for you. It sticks with me, and I started saying, I, I don't know how appropriate this really is. I'm sorry if it if it's if it's not appropriate. But when I think about her, I always get a little smile on my heart for probably a bad reason. But I think about the fact that in the end, she fought. <laughs> she fought. She made them sorry that they they did what they did before she even went out. I, and I have so much respect for that, you know, because that's a terrible position she was in. But boy, they just picked the wrong person. <laughs> You know, they just picked the wrong person to just assume she was going to be a victim uh, because she was never going to be that. Uh, So, anyway. It's, it's, uh, you know, it it, it, it was hard. It was a long time. And like I said, I would never change my phone number. When I know that he's off the earth, then I I, I would get rid of my landline number. (laughs) But until then, until then, I'm keeping my landline number at the same number. Oh, I hear you. I hear you so much. I mean, I I have him and about, I don't know how many other, I hate to think how many of these on that Illinois Department of Corrections website notification thing. So if something happens, I get notified. Because, uh, you know, I, look, I do believe in redemption for people, but there okay. are sometimes, and some people, like this guy who killed this woman I was talking about the other day, Alvin uh, Jones, it's not about there's redemption. There's no redemption for him. No. Uh, it's just none for him because what he have done to other people also, you know, how he brutally, brutally raped a young lady, you know, yeah. and other crimes that he had committed. You know, no, there's no redemption for him. No, not in this I life. So. No, I don't either because he is he's proven to us all and he had proven it before before he hurt Miss Geneva that he, if he's out in society he's gonna hurt people that are weaker than him right. or he believes are. Turned out Miss Geneva was stronger than him, but uh he had help, uh, you know. I, I, right, right. I think she would, if he didn't have that help, I think she would have whooped his, his you sure off. I don't have any question about that in my life, she'd have sent him out there running and screaming. But you handed out this letter. I don't know if you remember this, but I kept it and uh I didn't really recall that I kept it until I started looking through some of my stuff. I, I, I need you to send me a copy of it. Send it to my I, phone. I, I will. Uh, I, I'll, t- I'll take a picture and send it to you when we're done. That's the only letter I, I wrote that I didn't keep a copy of. I'll send you a copy of it, and if you want the original copy, you can have mine. Uh, uh, no, just send me a copy. Okay. But it's two pages, actually. And the first... Wow. Yeah, the first page is... It's got your name... Uh, Geneva Crosby and family. I won't read the whole thing to you, but it's Geneva Crosby and family and your address and the date, which was September 14th of 02. Um, well, I'm wrong about that. I had 03 listed. So, um, oh, no, I didn't. I had 02. Okay. But anyway, you just write a thing basically saying, you know, we lost a very special person. You talk about Geneva. And then you, then you say, um, you know, how much you appreciated uh, the community stepping forward and, and how much they meant to solve this, which is so true. I mean, and you, and you put my name, here, which I, it, it really means a lot to me that you did that. You said Detective Hammond and all his team, the men in blue did a great job. And it, at, uh, I, I hate to think that's the only reason I held on to this thing that my name I, was I in. I think I went up to the police station and brought that up there. Yeah, you may have. You may have uh, yeah, uh, that's what I did. And then there's this, a second the second page so the first page is just really remembering her and the second page uh and and thanking everybody and then the second page is is this very powerful um 
kind of letter and, and I, I you know i don't want to get into it too much i don't know how much i'll talk about this on the podcast but and i don't know if you wrote it or or but it is it, it's titled speaking from the grave of my crawl space geneva reading and it's from <laughs> it's from like her uh her um like her speaking you know what i mean do you remember right, that? Right, right. that was me <laughs> was it? Yeah. well that clearly in this and I, I i love it because it had to be like a release for you because you can clearly see your anger in this i mean you and i i, I mean totally justified yeah. and and it must have been good for you or or made you feel a little better to, to write it because i'll, I'll yeah. send you the i'll send you the picture so you can remind okay. you but uh yeah it's powerful i mean it's it's you do not pull any punches in it i will tell you um, you, you know yeah that's what my my kids are always saying they say i'm like my grandma and my mom <laughs> well i live rough right you know, I, yeah. I don't bother nobody but you know well, I would say that that's a very, very good thing um, because uh, you seem terrific, and um, from you know, I I I wish I'd have no, I wish I'd got the opportunity to meet her, but you know, hopefully I did right by her. So you never know on the course of over you know course of several years, you, you know, you put stuff on YouTube and these podcast things that you know right. might, might end up being thousands and thousands of people, and if it is, I think it's great that they hear your voice and they hear that. About her, you know, because hearing, yes. hearing me talk about it, you know, is good. But talk about her especially is good. But it, it's nothing it's like good. you really, you know, kind of uh, right, right. Uh, from your, I, from your I appreciate voice. it. You know, so, I call it an honor, you know. Well, it's an honor for me. I appreciate that. It's an honor for me that you, you're willing to talk to me and spend time uh, talking about it. So I really, really do appreciate it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, and I hope you feel better. Uh, oh yeah, you know what? Just talking to you this time, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, maybe it was a nervous stomach or something, you know. Uh huh. And I just said a prayer before I called you, and I'm, I'm feeling better. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Better. That makes me feel good. So there it is. As to the letter that we discussed, I sent her copies. I have my original here in my hand. I'm going to read it to you, page one, it's two pages, and it's it's got the heading, Geneva Crosby and Family, and her address, the date, September 14th, 2002, and a salutation, your kindness will live in our hearts to the Lawndale community family. The text, I'll read verbatim here. We lost a very special person that has touched our lives in so many different ways. To some, she, Miss Geneva, parentheses, was a feisty little lady that stood tall and to others, she was a dear friend, teacher, giver, and most of all, she was a mother and grandmother, not just to her blood family, but to those who knew her. We, the family of the late Geneva Redding, are eternally grateful for the support you've given us. Our grandmother, great-grandmother, was truly loved and will be deeply missed. And we can all look back and cherish the memories that can't be killed. Just look at the bedding of flowers at the corner of the 1900 block of Avers and see the beauty it holds. See Miss Geneva. If it wasn't for love, unity, strength, and courage of the Longdale community, the killers would not have been apprehended. Detective Mike Hammond and all his team with the men in blue did a great job. I know a lot of you will miss, miss Geneva with her sarcastic remarks while retrieving cans up and down the streets. Her block will miss the rattling of her gate at 6 a.m., the phone calls, and whatever she gave to show love, strawberries, flowers, or just a plain old hello, baby, with a smile. She still got your back. Just look around and see U-N-I-T-Y more than ever in the Lawndale community. We can't thank you enough. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Geneva Crosby and family, Golden family, and Bolton Johnson and Harris families. So that's the text. I appreciate her mentioning me. Like I said, I hate to think that that's the only reason I held on to this because my name's on it, but maybe so. But it, it's, they did a great job of summing that up, and uh, it's worth a read. Now, the second page of this, I struggled whether to read this or not. And Miss Crosby, when I told her about it, she kind of laughed and she forgot about it. She said, Oh, yeah, that's me. And I, I, it's cathartic. You can feel it and you can see it. And she deserved it. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to read it to you. Take it for what it is now. But this is a, a real expression I think bears remembering. 
It's titled Speaking from the Grave of My Crawl Space, Geneva, Reading, 1942, South Aver, Chicago, Illinois, 60623. And again, I'll read the text verbatim here. You took my life just to steal and rob me, an 85 little old lady like me. You beat me for I done you no wrong to you. I guess I do wrong for treating you like family members or friends. Oh, but God knows what you did. Yes, he knows just how you beat me in the head and my body and put your strong, parentheses, but yet so weak, hands around my neck and choked the life out of me. Oh, how God is shaking his head at you while calling me home to him so that I won't suffer your, the pain you inflicted upon me. As I lay here in my crawl space grave and listen at how you laughed, drank, and stole my, from my home, now you'll do the same thing I did, cry and beg for your life. From a crawl space grave, I wondered how, how, how can you cry when you took the last of a lady of a family tree, life in your hands for the name of cocaine. Cocaine, cocaine. As I lay here in the crawl space of my home, I called out your name, Alvin, 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 and you, Clarence, Clarence, Clarence. And you answered not, but cocaine yelled one time and you answered, Alvin, Clarence, you pray on the old and stole from the dead. Now the rocks and mountains I left behind will see the two of you rot in hell. For God gives life, and only God taketh away life. For he is almighty and don't need help from no one. Family and friends, as I speak from my grave, make very sure they get what's good for them. I got your back. Geneva Crosby, Little Rock. There's only one hero to this story, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Geneva Redding. She deserved a better fate, but fought until the end, and I respect that a great deal. If you think about it sometime, give her a thought, maybe a tip of your hat. If you do that, my world, it's a win, and she remains. Geneva Redding. So as I close today's episode, I have a couple of acknowledgments that I owe. First, of course, to the wonderful Geneva Crosby. I so appreciate her willingness to spend the time with me and give me her great memories of her grandmother. She told me she was nervous to think about talking to me after I first approached her, but felt so much better after we talked. Me too, Miss Crosby. You never know how a family member will feel being asked to revisit something as traumatic as this life event 20 plus years after the fact. But as you could probably tell, she was great and it felt much more like two old friends talking than an interview. I am really in her debt. And second, to retired Sergeant Ramon Ferrer. It's great to speak with you again, Ramon, and I appreciate your support. But then you've had support for me from the first day I walked on the street out of the academy. You have, and will always have, my deepest respect. Ramon is retired now from CPD, but continues his service to his community and to his faith. And finally, while I was finishing this episode up, I, or we, really, lost a close friend and a truly great policeman named Mark Vale. There's not enough time to try and tell you his complete story, but I'll tell you, I never knew a better policeman and one hell of a good man. He had an amazing way of differentiating the really bad guys from the people who were down on their luck or just products of bad circumstances. He was tough, smart, hilarious, and loyal. He will be missed by greatly by all who knew him. That I will never forget how influential he was to me, always, but especially as a very young policeman. If it is true that you're never really gone as long as someone speaks your name, Mark Vale has at least a hundred years left in him. My sincere love to his family. So that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for checking in. Please give me your feedback. If you have questions, I'll answer them. And if you're enjoying the plot podcast, please like and subscribe. I appreciate it. We'll be back. Until next time, be safe and watch out for each other.